video, we'll look at some advanced MIPS coding techniques, including allocating dynamic memory, doing file input and output, writing our own macros, organizing our programs into multiple files, and writing our own exception handlers. First, let's look at how to allocate memory dynamically. Recall that data we define in the data section is in this portion of memory. Data that is allocated at runtime will be in the heap. In a real operating system, programs request additional memory at runtime. The operating system will find a block of memory and allocate it to the program. In Mars, of course, we're emulating this behavior. The syscall to allocate memory is syscall 9. Before the syscall, we place the number of bytes we're requesting in A0. After the syscall, V0 contains the starting address of the allocated memory. Why is it called sbreak? Because the program break is the first address beyond the end of the data region. Break and sbreak are basic Unix memory management system calls, typically called from a library function such as C's malloc. Break and sysbreak dynamically change the amount of space in the heap. Mars implemented a system call to allocate heap memory, but not one to deallocate it. Since this is just an emulator, we're not doing any harm. Some online forums suggested a negative value for A0, but this causes an exception in Mars. This sample program shows how to allocate and use memory in the heap. In static memory, an array of five integers is created. This first block of code allocates 20 bytes of memory in the heap and saves the address in P. These 20 bytes will be used to hold a copy of the array. The program loops through the static array and dynamic array, copying one word at a time. T1 holds the address of the array in static memory, while T2 points to the array in dynamic memory. The load word and store word commands copy from static memory and store to dynamic memory. In each iteration, the two pointers are updated by 4 to point to the next word locations. In Mars, we can't deallocate the memory. In a real system, that would be a memory leak, but here we aren't doing any real damage. Let's look at Mars to see where to find the dynamic memory. This is our heap example program in Mars. I'm going to hit assemble. I'm going to skip down to the start of our loop. Notice down here that by default we're always in the dot data section. We've seen before how we could look at wherever the current stack pointer is. We can also look at the heap. So I'm going to change our memory view to be viewing the heap. Now I'm going to single step through. The word is copied from static memory and stored into the heap right here. Let's just single step through the loop and watch those values be copied into dynamic memory. This second example is very similar to the first example, except that we're copying a character at a time instead of a word at a time. In static data, we have a null terminated string of seven characters. We reserve eight bytes for that in the heap, the extra byte for the null terminator, then we loop through in a similar way, again using T1 and T2 as pointers into static and dynamic memory. The difference here is that we're going to increment our pointers by 1 in each iteration to point to the next byte instead of by 4 to point to the next word. Notice that we can print the string from the heap by putting the address of the string into A0. Here I have a sample file I.O. program that I've adapted from one in the Mars website. The file name I'm going to use for input and output is specified in a null terminated string. This program first writes the string about the quick brown fox to a file, closes it, then opens it again for read and reads it into an input buffer here. So first let's see how you open a file for writing. That's system call number 13. You have to load the address of the file name into A0 and set the flag A1 to 1 for write. 
Mode isn't used in Mars, but their sample program used it, so I went ahead and put a zero there, just as they did. All right, after the system call, V0 will hold the file descriptor or file handle, and we want to save that somewhere so that we can access that file later. This block of code will write to the file that we just opened. System call 15 is the system call for write. A0 needs to have that file descriptor that we saved and A1 needs to have the buffer address. We can also hard code the length. After the system call to write to the file, we need to close the file. Next, we open the file again, this time for read. The only difference is that A1 has a zero in it. And then we read from the file into our input buffer. And just to show that that really happened, we print out the string that was just read. Let's give that a run and see what happens. We see several things here. First we see our original string, and then we see after it was read, it was put into the buffer and also printed out here. Next we discuss macros. Macros enable you to specify a set of instructions that can be invoked with a single line of code. Macros are expanded by the assembler by substituting the macro body for each use in the program. Although a macro conceals implementation details like a function does, it's implemented in a completely different way. First, let's look at how to define a macro. The dot macro assembler directive defines the start of the macro and then the dot in macro ends it. Between those two assembler directives is the body of the macro. In this first example, it's just the system call to end a program. To invoke the macro, you simply use its name. We can also send arguments to a macro, which can be a register or immediate value. Here we see a macro to print an integer. The percent %x will be replaced either by a register or by an immediate value. The dot include assembler directive is necessary if you want to include a file of macros into the current file. You should put the dot include above the dot data section. Here's a sample program that demonstrates how to use macros. The program itself is trivial. It just loads a number 5 into T0 squares it, and stores it. Notice I have an include statement here for the macro file. The macro file is in the same folder. I'm going to be using the print int macro, which just has the system call for printing an integer, as well as one to print a string. Looking back at the program, I can invoke the print string macro with the actual string in the parentheses and I can invoke the print int macro with a register. Let's see how that works. One thing you'll notice when you assemble the file that everywhere that you invoked the macro, that invocation, just the name, is replaced with the actual body of the macro. And so you see these extra numbers here in the extra lines of code inserted into your code. They can make debugging a little bit messier. As you work on larger projects, you may want to divide your code into multiple files and assemble them together. In Mars, the files should be in the same directory. Make your subs global with the .global directive. Then go to Settings, Assemble All Files in Directory, and then back to Settings, Initialize Program Counter to Global Main. The terms exceptions, interrupts, and traps are not used consistently among different people. An exception is any event that causes a change in the normal flow of execution. Interrupts are often external events, such as signals from sensors or other hardware devices particularly in an embedded system. Traps are more likely internal events. When an exception occurs, the program's interrupted and a branch occurs to an exception handler 
also called an interrupt service routine. The exception could be a fatal error, in which case the program needs to halt, or a recoverable error that can be serviced so that the program can continue. In MIPS, exceptions are handled by coprocessor zero. When an exception occurs, the system enters kernel, not user mode. Coprocessor zero has four special registers. EPC holds the address of the offending instruction. Register 13 holds a cause code. Register 8 holds an address for bad exception. And 12 holds a status register. I have a list here for reference of cause codes. There are also special instructions to copy to and from coprocessor zero. As we've discussed before, Mars does not cause an exception on divide by zero. So that gives us an opportunity to write an exception handler to handle this. The exception handler code here was taken from the Mars website. In this program, I'm putting five into T1 and zero into T2. Then we have the trap instruction. This will trap if T2, my denominator equals zero and transfer control to the exception handler. The exception handler will basically print a divide by zero error. Here's the exception example. Let's see what happens. I'm going to assemble. I'm going to set a breakpoint right at the trap instruction. Then I'll single step through the trap. The trap immediately moves us to the exception handler down here. And notice we are in coprocessor zero. The program first backs up a copy of V0 and A0 to preserve those values that may have been used in the calling code. And then here we see it actually printing the string, divide by zero. Then it restores those values from V0 and A0, gets the address of the offending instruction, adds four to it to point to the next instruction, and then returns. And notice we're back at the divide now. So we divide. Again, there's no exception, but at least we know that there was a divide by zero. The book shows code for a bubble sort, so I thought it would be interesting to show that in MIPS. I have a short array, and I'm going to print the array before the sort and after. So let's first just run it and we see that it did indeed sort it. Let's take a quick look at the code. I have a function here to print the array. I call that before and after. And there's a helper function here to swap two consecutive values. If you recall what the bubble sort does, it's a loop within a loop that compares consecutive values. Here's the bubble sort code showing an inner and outer loop. The bubble sort is not a very efficient program, and we can quantify that in MIPS. We can go to Tools, Instruction Counter, connect to MIPS, and then run the program. And we see how many instructions were executed, and it also breaks it down by type. Another option here is to go to Tools, Instruction Statistics, connect to MIPS, and hit assemble and run, and it breaks it down a little bit differently on type of instruction. This would be most useful if you were writing different sorting algorithms and wanted to compare how efficient they are. Mm -hmm.